Good evening, everybody. It is a wonderful privilege to be with you tonight. And um, for another exciting study, you know, this past Sunday's message was divine power to control the mind. And so we're going to talk about access, the, the access divine power to control the mind. We're going to get a little more in depth. That's the whole point of our word studies at this point, as we're focusing on clarity for the year, focusing on the mind for the month of January. And at this point, we want to really go in and get into an application aspect. And so we've we've talked about some perspectives related to understanding the mind, understanding how the, the mind works, understanding how the mind affects our ability to be blessed by God, to receive from God specifically wisdom in everything. And then we are going to transition today to really look at where is the, the restriction, the blockage, the challenge, the, the burden, and how can we break through that? So let's go ahead and pray for our time together, and then we're going to get into this word. Our Father, we give you thanks. We praise you for this magnificent privilege that we have to be able to know you, to hear your word, to believe your word, to study your word, to get understanding of your word. And even the scripture tells us in all our getting, get an understanding. And so we thank you that we can be postured for that. And so, dear Father, we pray that you would truly, truly, truly position us to really be ready to receive, to, to feel the, the very fullness of your provision in the truth, that we might be transformed, that we might really be empowered. I even ask that you would truly give us breakthrough from this message that we might truly do that which you have equipped us to do and that would be rewarding to do. Bless our hearing, bless our receiving, bless our believing, bless our doing, bless our delivering. To the praise of your glory, we pray. Amen. All right, all right. So... We have talked from 2 Timothy, the 10th chapter, and other messages that I've done on Sundays, um, but I haven't gone into a study of 2 Timothy 1 through 6 in a word study, particularly because we've been focusing on the uh, Gospel of John for uh, the period of time that we had been, <laughs> and we, for basically a year and a half, really focused on really walking through the gospel of John, and as I share with you all uh, who are with us on a regular basis, and if you are just joining us for the first time, you can go back and catch uh, those messages on the YouTube channel, those studies, if you will. And you'll see that it was a really good segue and setup for us. And so I want to go ahead and jump into this today, tonight, um, and let us truly enjoy. So again, that topic that we're focusing on tonight is access divine power to control the mind uh, as i shared this past sunday's message was divine power to control the mind this one is okay let's now access that and so i want to 
read our primary text, 2 Corinthians 10 and 1 through 6, and then we'll begin to flow through this teaching and really just let the word of God unfold before us. So Paul says, I, Paul, myself, entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold towards you when I am away. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Ah, this here, this passage is so unique in that it's easy to focus this on others, but this passage really should be focused on ourselves. Now, I'm going to kind of start toward the bottom portion of this passage, and then I'll come back to the upper portion. When, when Paul talks about we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, I want to make sure you know the context that it's taken most of the time particularly because I was one of those people who took it in the context that it's taken most of the time, but not necessarily correct, appropriate. But there is an appropriate context. Generally, when this passage is looked at, it's looked at from the perspective that it is necessary that we destroy arguments and lofty opinions, raise against the knowledge of God, thoughts, that are contrary to the knowledge of God to obey Christ in other people as believers. Okay. We, we need to, we need to uh, push against the arguments of the left and push against the arguments of the right. We need to push against the arguments of the politicians we need to push against the arguments of the, the political establishment that's really trying to push some things. We need to push against, we need to destroy those arguments and lofty opinions. They don't want prayer in the school. We need to try to destroy it some kind of way. We need to bring it back. They don't want the Ten Commandments. We maybe need to bring that back. You know, it's, no, it's not what it's talking about. It's not what it's talking about. Let me tell you why. The only way you can go and take a thought captive to obey Christ is if you have authority over where the thought is. Huh? Come on now. Yeah. You know, I heard when preachers say, hey, man, like, <laughs> this is a little funny. Okay. The only way you can take something captive is if you have authority over it. Let me just ask you a question. Do I have authority over anybody's thoughts but mine? No. We only have authority over our own thoughts in such a way that we can take them captive. Now watch this. If we are seeking to take others' thoughts captive to obey Christ, that is dominance against somebody who's equal to you. That means you're treating your brother and sister like a slave. Mm. So this can't be talking about us taking other people's thoughts captive as the primary thought process. Is it possible that we can argue against things and we can, you know, win in the perspective of the truth being made known? Yeah, but you can't take nobody else's thoughts captive. We cannot take anyone else's thoughts captive. Therefore, if 
Taking every thought captive to obey Christ is not based on somebody else and really only based on me, that means these arguments and lofty opinions are in me. Or in your case, in you, if you have them. <laughs> and so the divine power that we have or have access to through Christ is a divine power to destroy strongholds. But where? What, what, what is strongholds? Okay, before I come to strongholds, I want to jump back over to the top portion of this. I want you to see in the first verse, Paul speaks with some unique terminology. He says, I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Watch this. He has hyphen here. If you look in, in your Bible, it may have this. Uh, this is the ESV that I'm reading from. There's a hyphen here. And technically, this hyphen that he has here where he says, I am I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold towards you when I'm away. This right here is almost like quotations where he's actually conveying what it is that they have said about him. So this is not actually what he is, what he's doing, what he thinks or feels. This is the accusation this is the opinion of the people at Corinth about him. And you see at the very end, exclamation, it's kind of like he's saying, huh, yeah, so really, this, this is what y'all think about me. He's, he's making sure to scream it out and exclaim, hey, I hear what you're saying and I'm paying attention. He then begs them to think rightly that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness such with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suppose us of walking according to the flesh. Meaning, when, when necessary, we can stand and communicate the power and authority that we walk in, but that's not... The intention, the intention is to be essentially a shepherding natured person consistent with Christ. Now, they have obviously some opinions that are erroneous. They suppose him to be walking according to the flesh. But they are thinking about it differently than what they ought to be thinking about it. He says, oh, yes, we do walk in the flesh but not within the context of our spiritual devotion. We walk in the flesh because we are human nature. Huh? But because we are human nature does not mean we give ourselves to, listen carefully, to the flesh's satisfaction and pleasure as premier and primary. Now, understand, while we live in the body, we do not deal with our life in the body according to the pleasures and satisfactions of the body. That's what he means by are not waging war according to the flesh. Why is he saying war? Well, here's the thing. The body is really functioned or guided and directed by the mind. Huh? So if the body, the flesh, is actually given life and direction and influence and perspective and motivation and inspiration from the body, even though it has senses, that's another conversation, essentially, there's a warfare going on somewhere. It's in the mind. And the reason we know it's in the mind is because everything as it pertains to the warfare, is related to trying to overcome, watch this, the mind. Or more so overcome in the mind. Now, I got to say this real quickly before we transition to our next point. It is important that we control our mind. Watch this. Let me tell you who we should not control. One, we should not control each other. And number two, we should not control God, which is really number one. 
We should control our mind. Does that mean in our positions of influence and authority and roles and responsibilities that we do not provide appropriate leadership, guidance, and direction? No. It means control is off limits for us except for our own mind. And watch this. Here's the truth. The reason we have so many issues in human nature, but then even in some environments in the religious space, I don't say the church because you don't necessarily have it in the church, but you get where I'm coming from. In the church environment, the church world is because the legalistic thought process, the religious thought process is about controlling other people, whereas Jesus came so that we could actually control our own minds. Paul even says in 1 Corinthians 12, watch this. Let me see. Is that 1 Corinthians 12? I think that's the familiar passage. Yes. No, no, no. It's 2 Corinthians 12. I'm sorry. Is it? Hold up. Y'all give me one second. I think it might be 10. Ah, oh, why is Leo not getting it? Where is it? I, what's the, I beseech you there for, brother? Uh, Leo is not on point tonight. Uh, I'm going to find it and come back. In one of the Corinthian letters, I don't know why I can't find this. Paul says to his readers, to present their bodies a living sacrifice. I think it might be a letter. Living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is their reasonable service. And to not be conformed to the world, but be transformed, transformed by the renewing of their mind. I don't, I don't know why I can't find this, y'all. I know where it is, but okay. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Listen carefully. The renewing of your mind. You know what that really means? Using your mind the way you're supposed to again. That's really what it means. Renewing your mind basically says, hey, you have not been using your mind the way you're supposed to. You have not been doing what you're supposed to do with your mind the way you were supposed to. And as a result, because of Christ, you have the ability to return to the utilization, function, and focus of your mind thank you the way it ought to be my goodness so with that said strongholds strongholds can be looked at in two perspectives in the old testament strongholds carry two different uses or different uh applications or ways in which they were used for example David dwelt in strongholds for him it was he dwelt in the hill country area and what they would do is you know they go and dig out rocks out of the mount side of the hill sides and mountains and what would happen is they would then dig it out in such a way that they could take this big piece of rock and kind of push it back in front of that cave so that you can't see what's on the inside that was a stronghold that makes sense so they were able to live dwell and abide on the inside of it be safe from outside uh assault as long as people didn't know that they were there but the stronghold was also to keep them from being noticed that was one way a stronghold was used but there's a, a more consistent perspective of stronghold that was more consistent with different cities and places that was very common strongholds were actually protective measures like gates of cities you know the old movies where you know they're doing the fighting and all that kind of stuff and the old forts and you know people come and they try to do everything they can to to knock down the gates and you know destroy the gates well here's the thing in the city 
which essentially was a kingdom because these cities in Old Testament time had kings in the city. So it, it was really a kingdom. It was the city of the king, you know, like you, you heard the city of David, right? It's kind of like the city of the king. With that, this city would have two strongholds in it, meaning it would have two points of protection in it. One was the perimeter, but primarily the gates of the perimeter. The walls were generally built very high, so it's very difficult for people to just get over the walls without being seen. But so they would have to try to um, take over the city or get into the city to take it over first and foremost through the gates. Like you'd have to have a very unique military strategy to get through the gates. Now, once you get through the gates, you don't have control, but you do have access to the city, to the kingdom. You are in the vicinity now, but you don't have control. The reason you don't have control because the seat of control is in the palace, which is the second stronghold. You have also gates and many instances around that, but you also have your elite forces of soldiers there as well, guarding the palace. Why? Because you got to protect the king. You take the king out, guess what? Everything else goes with whoever took the king out. How do I know? Let's go over to see what Jesus said in Luke 11 and 17 through 22. Let's see here. Now, let me give you some, some background real quick before we jump into it. Uh, Jesus here cast out a demon spirit from a mute person. And then the chief priests and folks come saying, oh, this man cast out devils by Beelzebub and all this kind of stuff. I mean, they was like, ah! <laughs> But he, Jesus 17, knowing their thoughts, said to them, every, listen carefully, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Hmm. Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, listen carefully, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. Okay, hold up, y'all. Did you hear that? In other words, when a strong man, this is the king. The king is the strong man. He's, he's a wise king. He's a very strategic king. He's a mighty king. This is a strong man, fully armed, meaning his palace gates are guarded. And so is his perimeter gates guarded. But he makes sure that if nothing else is fully guarded, which is why the 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 president's place is so hard to get into. Whether they doing right or not don't matter. Okay, it's a perspective. the The palace gates being fully guarded. Jesus says, "His goods are safe." But when one stronger than him attacks. And overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted, and he divides his spoil. Mm -hmm. Now you say, Leo, what's this guy do we talking about? Well, first of all, Jesus told us something about the stronghold. He said, okay, understand, there are soldiers at the gates. There are soldiers at the gates. The perimeter gates. But here's the thing. It's not that the strong man disregards his perimeter gates. It's that he understands where the greatest threat is. It's at what? It's at the palace. 
for that's where the goods are. That's where the treasure is. Hmm. I thought Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In other words, where that which is most valuable is, that's where your subconscious will be. But then the other perspective is this. Wherever your treasure is, that's where your subconscious also is. In other words, your heart is the place of your treasure and your treasures are in your heart. And what are your treasures? Your treasures obviously are not arguments and lofty opinions unless you treasure them huh? and hold to them dearly. See, you, you got to understand, Jesus was actually kicking Satan out of the spirits of people. He was kicking them out of the minds and the hearts of people. And these folks are saying that if you're kicking Satan out, you're casting out Satan. And he's like, that don't make sense. Why would Satan kick himself out? That's literally what they were saying. They were saying Satan is casting out Satan. And they know that does not make sense. It doesn't make sense. This just tells you how deceitful the religious system was and also how deceitful the religious systems still are today. People say the dumbest stuff. Let me just tell you, I don't understand how it is that people are out here saying that God is saying stuff that he ain't say when God was one, extremely intelligent and very simplistic in what he said so that it was very clear to everybody, even the babies. And you got people out here making up all kinds of stuff about God and telling people stuff that they got to do about God. You got to say this. You got to wear this. You got to look this way. You got to feel that way. You got to uh, say it just like this. If you don't say it like this, then it ain't right. Did you? So Jesus came to disrupt that and say, listen, that ain't how it go. Let me show you how it really go. Here's how it goes. It goes like this. That the strong man who's seated in the palace on the throne is either one who is consistent with arguments and lofty opinions or he is consistent with the obedience of Christ. And if, if the strong man in your mind, in the very palace, throne seat of your conscience, which is at the subconscious level more so, if Satan is there, you need to know that there is divine power that can be accessed to destroy the strongholds of the gates of the perimeter and the gates of the palace that Satan has set up in your mind and uproot all of that foolishness. Every argument and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God can be destroyed. And Satan got to get out of your mind. Now, what does those lofty opinions and arguments look like? Real quickly, Isaiah 29 and 13. We actually touched on this briefly last week. Jesus, uh, the Lord says, because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, subconscious, subconscious is not mine. Why is the subconscious not mine? And their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Listen to me carefully. Listen to men and women who preach to you the word. But the people, the men and women who are telling you what they saw growing up, this is what they told us. This is how they said to do it. You, you want to watch them because everything that they're saying is a lofty opinion and argument raised against the knowledge of God. We know it because God tells it. Watch what God says, though. He says, therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish. Sound like Beelzebub being cast out by the kingdom of God. He also says, and the discernment of their discerning 
men shall be hidden. Sound like Beelzebub. Sound like Satan being cast out. You want to cast out the devil? You want to cast out evil spirits? How about you start speaking the truth in such a manner that people can then take their own thoughts captive to obey Christ and destroy arguments and lofty opinions? Meaning, give people the truth so that they can access divine power to control their mind. That's it. That's it. Here's the thing. They're strongholds. They're, they're, there are guards that Satan has set up through the lofty opinions, through the arguments, through the commandments of men that we have fear for, through the wisdom of the wise, through the discernment of the discerning. He set up some stuff and you got to fight through all of that. Let me just tell you, the fight is worth it. Fight. Why? Because when you fight it, this is what Paul says happens after you go through this fight. He says, being ready to punish every disobedience. Oh, wow. When your obedience is complete, that means once I access this divine power to control the mind, my own more so, what happens is I then get positioned to where when disobedience seeks to rise in me, seeks to try to take my seat, I can be like the strong man of Luke, have fully armed guards in my palace, make sure my goods are safe so no strong man can come and overtake me. And guess what helps us? We have Christ on the throne of our heart and he has a seat next to him where we get to sit to where we receive his authority and then he gives us the authority to then go and control our mind as delegates of his authority oh that's good stuff i know it's good god is good too all right so let's transition how do we then access this divine power to control the mind how do we access the divine power? Where's the divine power at? How does the divine power get where it needs to get in our subconscious? Because, you know, that's where it needs to be, right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Sound like John, right? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But not only that, he also said that the Father and Christ, they come and make their abode with them us meaning they come and dwell with us so where, where are they going to stay at when they come where are they going to stay when they come i tell you in our heart why where does the lord live he's the king of kings and the lord of lords let me ask you a question a diplomatic authority and delegation when they come where do they stay don't they stay in the residence of the diplomat they're, they're, they're visiting? Don't they live in the palace? Huh? Isn't that what it's that? They come stay in the in the, the White House? Yeah. They, they come to where the authority, the strong man lives. So where are they going to come? Aren't they coming to the house of the one who is the strong man? Guess who the strong man is? You for your own conscience. And for me, it's me. Now watch this. Where are they going to go? They're going to abide and set up residence. They're going to go and bring their bags and all that they have to live and be in our subconscious. Mm. So that. Every obedience can be complete by our ability to be a strong man, fully armed with guards over our palace. So the question is, how, how, do, we, how do we access this divine power? Where do we get this divine power from? Let's go to Psalm 119. Read verses 9 through 11 here. Watch this. How can a young man keep his way pure? 
let's 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 say it this way how can a young man and a young man is actually a strong man but how can a young man keep his way from being disturbed by things that are impure Aren't arguments and lofty opinions against the knowledge of God impure? Ah. So, so how do how how can a young man, in other words, how can we who are in our youthfulness of our faith, how can we keep our way when we have an adversary wanting to disturb us? with arguments and lofty opinions against God. Look at what the word says. By guarding it, there's a reason it says guard, according to your word. Jesus says, you got to be a strong man, fully armed, guard your palace. Hmm. He says, guard it according to the word of God. Guarding your way. Well, where is the way? Where does the word, okay, we know what, what, what the divine power is accessed through the word, right? Because that's the thing that helps us to keep our way pure. pure. <laughs> that's the thing that gives us to keep our way pure. Mm, we making good time tonight. But watch this. So how do I get access to this word that will help me keep my way pure. How do I get access to this word that I use as a means of guarding my way? Watch this. With my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Oh. So now the heart is introduced and the heart seeks, the whole heart seeks. But it says, by guarding it according to your word, okay, your word, so his word is a reflection of him, so basically, my heart is seeking him through the seeking of his word. Did it say the seeking of religious experience? Did it say the seeking of those things that are approved by religious people? No, seeking the word. I know I look a little nuts tonight, but this is true. This is good. Watch what he says, though. He says, I have stored up your word. I'm going to just stop there for a moment. Didn't that sound like treasures? Didn't, didn't that sound like treasures? You taking treasures. Where, where does the good man, the strong man, keep his goods? He keeps his goods in his palace. So we, these people who want to have a strong force, and guard against our way, which means our way flows from our heart. If we want to guard our heart, which is really like the illustrative symbolic place of our palace, our subconscious, and then the conscience is like our perimeter gates. So what he's saying is I store his word, that's the treasure, where? In the heart, meaning where does God need to be? In my subconscious. His word needs to be in my heart. Why does it need to be in my heart? That I might not sin against you. In other words, that I might not fall short in the fight against my adversary. One, and then two, that I might not fall short in measuring up to the expectation of my master my God, my Savior, my King. The treasure is the word. Not any experience. Because I guarantee you, if you couldn't have any experience, I guarantee you, you can have the word. Hmm. You can have the word. So, I can say of a fact tonight that God 
not only wants us to access divine power to control the mind, he wants us to understand what mind we need to control. He wants us to understand what the divine power is. And in having clarity about those, that go our word for the year clarity, having clarity about those, then we have understanding about not only what to access, how to access, but the fact that we need to access it. The only way you and I or anyone else can be strong, like Jesus said, a strong man, fully, how did he say it? Let me go back to it. I like the way it was written here. Said a strong man, fully armed. Oh, we're not going to talk about the armor tonight. But fully armed. Guards, yes, let me go ahead and read it. Ephesians, let me go ahead and read it. I got a little time. I wasn't planning on it, but I got a little time. I need to just, just put it in your mind. And watch, watch how, it, it, it's no contradiction. It's no contradiction. Here we go. Here we go. He said, finally, be strong in the Lord. Any, any reason why you understand Paul said be strong in the Lord? Be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his, the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God. What did Jesus say? A strong man. Are you a strong man? My, my baby over here says I'm a strong girl. <laughs> When it says strong man, it's talking about the symbolic nature, all right? Okay, so are you a strong woman? Are you a strong man? Are you a strong girl? Are you a strong boy? <laughs> so he says, put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. A strong man fully armed guards his own palace. Schemes of the devil, what are what the schemes of the devil trying to do? They're trying to exalt and destroy the knowledge of God. It's trying to exalt against and destroy the knowledge of God. Whereas our power is designed to destroy the arguments and every lofty opinion that raises itself up against the knowledge of God. Oh. This kingdom stuff is about more of the thought process than it is the external. And here's what you got to understand. When the thought process is appropriately dealt with according to kingdom perspective, then the life then flows consistent with the manifesting of that perspective in its environment that's why we see genesis one as what it is we're going to be going there next week so he goes on for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood he said that in second corinthians but against rulers hmm, against the authorities these are strong men themselves who seeking to dethrone your strongness <laughs> against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, in the mind, in the air. You know, they say, get your, get your head out the clouds. That this is kind of like a reference to that. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. What do you mean the evil day? The day where evil comes against you. And having done all to stand firm. What do you mean done all? Having stored up the word in your heart, put on the armor. What's the armor? Stand there for having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, have, and for shoes, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace in all circumstances, taking up on you the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. You know what this need to, you need to see? You need to see that, that this is a warrior king, meaning you are to be a warrior king or a warrior queen of your own heart. 
That's what it's saying. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. The spirit doesn't mean speaking in tongues where you can't understand. The spirit means according to the spirit of truth because it says capital S, P-I-R-T. And when we were in the study of John, Jesus told us the nature of the spirit. So that means you need to be praying in the spirit in the sense of you need to be listening to the spirit to be your lead God in truth. He's like your general as you are dealing with the realities of the assault of your adversary. That's what it's saying. All of this is an intelligible reality. All of this is able to be understood with clarity and therefore is designed to have a mind that is renewed, that is on, and that is engaged. People playing games out here and let them play them. And guess what's going to happen while they're playing them games? What did Jesus say? But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil, meaning he takes away his treasures. He actually disarms him and actually uh, not just uh, disarms him, he embarrasses him. And that's what happened when we don't truly walk in the word of truth. We get embarrassed by Satan. Oh, you probably ain't heard it like that. Yes. Jesus, majority of what he taught, watch this. He told Pilate, remember we was in John. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. In other words, I do not sit on thrones like you all. I sit on the thrones of the hearts of people. Mm. Matter of fact, he said, I came to bear witness to the truth. That's what he said when we was closing it. What he said? Okay, I'm about to shut it down. Is it what he said? Watch this. Where is it? He said, "For this, this is uh, John 18, 37. Then Pilate said to him, "So you are a king?" Jesus answered, "You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world. What's the purpose?" To bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Listens to my voice. Okay. He that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the truth. In other words, receive the word into the heart. In other words, everyone who has the ability to hear truth, meaning that they have uprooted. They are vigilant against the adversary. They are the strong man. How did, you, how did Luke say it? They are the strong man, fully armed, guarding his own palace. And Jesus says those people have received his truth. Mm. Okay. All right. Got to close it down. Any feedback from Zoom land, Facebook world? Let me look over here in Facebook world. All right. Zoom land, Zoom land, Zoom land. Come on, I see you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, just giving honor to God for his word, his truth. Um, the word is so on point. <laughs> Sometimes, Pastor, I feel like, are you in the closet? Like, how do you know what we individually, well, I know. I know how you know. Forgive me for saying that. but. A good guarding our ask, minds, <laughs> guarding our minds. Last week, we, we were dealing with uh, what we hear, you know, going into our subconscious, learning how the heart and the soul and the mind works together. And God comes back and reminds us diligently, be careful of what our minds are doing, right? So I just always want to testify. This week, I was home and I hadn't eaten anything the night. Well, let's go back. Before I had this low blood sugar, I had a friend of mine uh, call and remind me of 
my son dying. So he was hurt in a homicide. Let's just say that. And she said, oh, Jacob used to call me at three in the morning, eight in the morning. Oh my God, why did you take him to his dad's house? Oh my God. She went into this. She just broke it down. She reminded me yeah. of my past, right? And then the word mm -hmm. says, guard our minds. Mm -hmm. Listen, to, remember what we listened to. And then it came after the fact. So sometimes when the word comes forth, it's to remind you or or protect you from something that's going to come, that's going to indeed test you, right? To see how sharp you are in the word and how much you're going to hold on to God. So as soon as I went to bed that night, I didn't eat because I was just in that mode. How could I? How could I drop my son off? And I, my mind started moving and I was like, okay, I'm hungry, but I didn't get up. The next day I took my blood pressure pill empty and I drank coffee. My hands started sweating. I couldn't breathe. And I started feeling as if uh, my heart was stopping. And all I could say is, Lord, help me. Like, God, I know you're with me. God, just give me another chance to breathe. But I did it to myself. So what am I saying? We always have to be present with God at all. I guess that's why the Lord says, keep my mind stayed on you. Those that keep their mind stayed on me will be in perfect peace, right? Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and we have to guard it with the word of God daily, all day. And it's like the older you get, the more <laughs> you have to remind yourself hey, you're not a kid, but you are a kid in Christ. You have to feed yourself the word just as much as you need to eat food. So I'm so grateful. What am I saying? Uh, Pastor, I'm grateful for the word that you bring. I'm grateful that, grateful that it does apply to my life. And I'm grateful that I don't live in my past. That is my past. That is my testimony that God is a keeper in spite of what we go through because everybody has a story. Everybody has experienced some type of trauma or some type of rejection. Man born of a, a few days and full of troubles, right? So mm -hmm. I'm grateful for the word tonight. I'm grateful for that I have another testimony. I'm grateful that God does guard my mind. And so that's why, Pastor, I texted you and was like, give me the word before the word comes. <laughs> because I know this is a setup. I know that. I want to be found having something to say every week because I want the enemy to know that God is present. No matter how he makes me, no matter what the flesh feels, the spirit is eating. I eat well. The table is always spread on Wednesday night. We get the word and God is, he is alive in me. I didn't die. I yet live in him and him. I move, live and have my being. I'm cutting it off, pastor. I have to stop. But yes, yes, yes. welcome whoever is on the other side. God is alive. Um, we are yet waiting on the Lord to return. And when he come get me, I want to be ready. May God bless you and keep you. It's my prayer. God bless you. God bless you. Look like somebody else might want to say something. Let me just see. Okay. Um, y'all, you know, I think the most important perspective that I can leave with you tonight mm -hmm. is when Jesus said, I came to set the captives free. In other words, he came to dethrone Satan from having authority on the seat of your subconscious. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> you got to know that. And what you got to understand is when Ooh, Jesus, the awareness is that once you are confidently aware that Christ has overthrown Satan from the seat of the throne of your subconscious, you got to know there's like a coronation of Jesus coming and saying, be seated where I intended you to be all along and watch what happens with your life. Watch what happens with how you engage with people professionally. Watch what happens, how you engage with people in family. Watch what happens in how you take care of your body and how you guard this temple, right? That's the important perspective that when it comes down to it, 
when people have said in the past that Jesus is not concerned about this earth, that's true. Why? Because if he has your mind, the earth will be taken care of by your mind. You got to understand what he did in the beginning. He made the creation. Then he made the creatures. And then he made us as little lower creators to have dominion in all creation and over the creatures. And guess what? We use to influence with the context of our dominion. It is not our bodies. It is our mind, starting with our subconscious and then flowing into our conscience through the vehicle of our body. Our body came from the earth and he blew into it. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself for next week. God bless you. Listen, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. We might have to continue to mind for another month. I don't know. We'll see. We'll be prayerful about that. For but six months past. <laughs> <laughs> we need clarity. Hey, we man. Need clarity. So hey, let man. me go ahead and pray for us. Our Father, we thank you. You answered our prayer tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. And we thank, thank you, Jesus. for it. You. Hey, thank you, God. You are magnificent. Thank you, Jesus. Keep us. Let this word be hidden in our heart that we might not sin against you. Grant us to live to the praise of your glory and to the benefit that comes with it for us Thank and you, for Jesus. others so that we might glorify you in the way you intended. And Jesus our Christ, we pray. Thank God. 